with two number ones under their belt on a massive tour of Asia, A1 were experiencing massive popularity. As we go on and on the tour, a lot of fans are just following us, and following us, which is what we really want, which is excellent. But on the last leg, things took an unexpected turn. Indonesia was particularly chaotic. We turned up to a Mohan Jakarta for a signing. I pretty got a sense early on that it was a bit, bit out of control. You could see girls at the front actually being squashed, so their faces were right up against the, the glass. And, you know, I remember looking up and sort of looking at everyone going, can you see this? What, what, what's going on here? And so, you know, they sort of went and pushed, you know, some people, you know, back. But I just think the sheer en enormity of, of um, how many people were there, it was just uncontrollable. And we've signed, like, one autograph when people say, oh, you got to go, you got to rush. I'm like, what's, what's going on? And we weren't told what, what happened. We just had to, they said something about too many people, we have to cancel. Unfortunately, four young girls got squashed to death um, at the signing. The ban is at this point in an extreme shock. shock condition. Your fans got excited and then they started to scream and yell and start pushing one another out. That's when the unfortunate things happen. Two girls got tripped over and got trampled over. And they were sisters. And then two more from the heat, the intense heat. Um, passed out and then got um, trampled over and we didn't know anything about it. I guess it's something that we can never fully come to terms with or accept. We know that we, we didn't cause it, but we also know that if we weren't there, if we hadn't been there, those uh, people would still be alive maybe, you know, and that is hard. Devastated by the Jakarta tragedy, A1 withdrew from the public eye. Their overseas record label, who'd organised the signing, were in the firing line, and all communication lines were stopped. You know, none of us were sort of in the frame of mind to, to begin work again, because, you know, we obviously didn't get into a, a music career for that to happen. You know, no, no one does. So um, I think it, it, was a, it was a time for us to sort of reevaluate what we were doing and why we were doing it. Luckily for the lads, they had their songwriting royalties to tide them over in the long months that followed. And when they did get back into the studio, they were determined to do things their way. We did, you know, a whole bunch of songwriting. We became more of a, a band band rather than a, a boy band. We came back with a very different sound. I think we were at a point where we, we make or break here, so the next single really has to count and it has to be something good. In February 2002, after nearly a year out of the limelight, the band released a new single, Caught in the Middle. Caught in the Middle was a tremendous success. It was a big hit for us all over the world. That track really took us all by surprise. I mean, I wrote that track with Paul. I didn't want to release it. I didn't believe in that song. And then the record company basically turned around and said, Caught in the Middle is your first single. We don't care what you say. You're releasing it. Which, thank God they did. Because it was, you know, it turned out to be the biggest song A1 had ever had. Their gamble had paid off. And the song even scaled the charts in countries that had previously snubbed them, like America. We've been given a lot of stick for being a sort of very cheesy, very pop-tastic band. So when we were actually able to show and do what we were supposed to be doing from day one, and it was accepted, and not only accepted, but it was huge, that was a bit of a like, huh, we told you we were good. What? Why would you give us so much shit? It was fucking great. Like an eight-legged phoenix that winks at you a lot, A1 had risen from the ashes. But in a dramatic twist, by the end of the year, A1 would be no more. Having 
improve their skills with the self pen smash hit caught in the middle, the A1 boys were musically maturing and moving on from the teeny pop sound. A lot of people are used to us doing uh, dance routines and, and you know, all the kind of usual type of mind and thing. And we're just doing something a little bit different, a little bit more intimate this time. But as their music changed, so did their bond. There was a weird dynamic now within the band because you had two musicians and then two sort of vocalists in the middle, but one not really doing much. I think he felt more comfortable in A1 as an all dancing pop group and probably not so comfortable with what we had become. Looking back now, I think maybe Paul just stopped caring that much and sort of withdrew a little bit more. You know, often the biggest rows come out of the most tiniest ridiculous thing. I said to him, when you're doing backing vocals, can you pull back off the mic a little bit because it's really hard to hear what you're doing if you're singing the lead on something. To which point he threw down the microphone and walked off stage. And then I think for an entire month that we were on tour, he refused to speak to me. Already tense, relations were about to be tested once and for all. We'd been trying for ages to have a hit in France, and the way we did that was by doing a uh, duet with a French artist. But unfortunately, she requested that she could start the song, which um, just happened to be Paul's verse, of course, in the middle. You said the love was just a state of so, unfortunately, Paul's vocals were lifted off. We were at Heathrow going to Paris, and he doesn't show up. Where's Paul? All I got was a text saying, read my letter of resignation. It was just out of the blue. It basically said uh, he'd been pushed out of the limelight, and he gave evidence of this by the fact that he wasn't singing on particular songs. It was him not turning up to the studio session in For Same With Brain You, him being bumped off the French single, and another one that he didn't want to sing on. I mean, I'd have liked to have been on a couple of Tracy Chapman's records, but I wasn't, I wasn't in the studio. So that's just how it happens. If you're not there, you're not on the record. It just seemed rude, actually. You know, we'd been great friends, your brothers, and then it was a bit like, oh, I know you need me, but fuck off. That's how it felt. I actually couldn't believe it. I remember being very hurt, and um, I guess I'm still a little bit hurt in the way he did it. But unfortunately, when a member of the band just doesn't show up, the label sort of goes, okay, the cracks are beginning to show. You know, what are we investing our time and money into? Everything is going great. And here's this fucker, whatever you want to call him, ruining it for everybody. I've since heard him say, well, I figured the ship was sinking, so I thought I'd better get off. That's what he said. That's really, really nice, considering we'd been mates for that long. Paul leaving was, uh, was definitely the catalyst in the split up of, of the group. We were still powering ahead with everything. We had the budget for the next video come in, all these concerts lined up. We were going to go back to America and do a tour over there. And when Paul left, that sort of sent a shockwave through everything. After five years of chart supremacy and 10 million global sales, A1 parted company with Sony in 2002 and never got another record deal. Thank you. Still to come, with their reunions looming, the bands reminisce about the good times and the rubbish ones. We were, you know, the one direction of pop ten years ago, you know. So it's kind of amazing to, to look at this stuff and to sort of remember it's kind of how big everything was. In the early noughties, A1 were riding the crest of a pop wave. With millions of adoring fans across the globe, the foursome dominated the charts. But they disappeared from the spotlight after a sensational walkout by founding member Paul. Now, 12 years after the split, Mark, Ben and Christian are still coming to terms with the loss of their pop crown. After A1 ended, Christian returned home to Norway, where he carved out a solo career notching up three hit albums and three number one singles. Now he lives in Oslo with his 22-year-old girlfriend, Martina. When I met Christian, I didn't know that much about A1. And uh, I heard a couple of their hits, and it's really nice. 
And the dancing? <laughs> <laughs> you enjoy the dancing? Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> It's going to be, you know, back together, officially. A1 back in the UK. It's exciting. Yeah, very. <laughs> yeah, it'll be good for us. And a way to sort of, well, not end, because it might not be the end, but at least have uh, these final chapters of A1 be a very positive thing. Back in the UK, after abandoning his solo ambitions, Mark plays gigs with his parents' band. As he'd always hoped, his audience has matured beyond teenage girls. It's not that different to, uh, you know, doing Hyde Park or, you know, Wembley Arena or Royal Albert Hall. It's not that different, honestly, really. At the end of the day, just love playing to a, uh, to a great crowd, really friendly crowd. And um, this is where I came from. This is my, my you know, my background, and, and I'm always happy to just play with them whenever I can. That's all right, that's all right, coming in, say hello. After A1 fizzled out, Mark traded in the celebrity lifestyle to move back with his mum and dad in Surrey. We never really had a chance to sort of tell our story. And I think from, a, from the fans' perspective, we were kind of there and then we were just disappeared. And, um, and I don't think they ever really uh, you know, knew why Paul left. The one thing I can kind of take away from it straight away is just to have the chance to kind of tell the fans what was really Swing going on. A few yeah. I well, a part of me feels like I have to leave all that, well I'm not leaving it behind because I'll always be really grateful for appreciate it. appreciate it because there yeah. were fantastic yeah. times but I think you need to take a step forward and do something different. Yeah. Like Christian, Ben also shares his home with his 22 year old girlfriend, ex Miss Norway, Sarah. Do you think it'll be strange having that media attention again? People like, I don't know, I don't know. stuck I mean, in the street. It, yeah, <laughs> that kind of side of things I think is going to be uh, not a pain, but I think it's going to be just sort of readdressing and again what it used to be like. But I think the fun part of it is obviously actually doing stuff in the UK that you know my family and friends can see. And it'll be fun for you, won't it, to come to. Come along to the gigs yeah. with your banner. I'll be the groupie. Throw knickers. I'll be like, oh, who's are these? Oh, Sarah's. Extra large. No. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. The Norwegians just love Ben. Two years ago, the twinkle toed, boy faced wonder rocked into second place in their version of Strictly Come Dancing. Today, he's a successful music producer working at his home studio for the likes of Craig David, Robin Thicke and Alexandra Burke. I basically live in this studio. I, I work here day in, day out. I have all sorts of different artists coming through from Bo Bruce to Boyzone to I've done some tracks with Robin Thicke. They go and have a lot of fun with it, touring and stuff. And then I, I sit, sit back in this studio while everyone else goes and have fun with the tracks. That's actually pretty good. 